Hello everybody and welcome back to Horizon Forbidden West where we're about to get the grand tour of all the cool old tech stuff that still works. I bet you too I can get like a power source or something. I don't know why I've gone hail belly. Well that happens when I'm tired. <laughs> the, um, that's what happens when you grow up in your formative years in Missouri, the Midwest. But I also can't enunciate. That's because I also lived in the West. <laughs> Nothing's enunciated <laughs> in Western United States. Uh, it's so funny when you hear people from the East Coast, because they tend to, like, at least, um, anyway, that's totally, totally boring. Anyway, I remember, I do know that sometimes I'll hear people who are more from, like, the East side of things, like, East side of the U.S., they will enunciate their, like, T's, their, like, consonants are, like, harder, and I'm like, Wow, that's so much effort, <laughs> but it, it it does sound better, <laughs> honestly. It sounds clearer. It's easier to understand than just a blah. Anyway, we're about to get the grand tour. Oh boy. It's glitched, incomplete. Their full truths are lost to us. It's a chaplain's duty to make sense of these visions as. Ah. Uh... Uh, interpretation based on limited data. I do that. <laughs> the ten were dedicated soldiers. Working together as a squad and sharing in their duty. And when the time came for battle, they took to the skies and leaped to glory. All Tanakh seek to follow their example. For the chief, oh boy. it was one of the few things the clans had in common. Um, I maybe shouldn't try to unlock the full hologram because I uh, guarantee you their interpretations are going to be probably pretty different from what it actually is. Oh, hey. Don't mind me. Just staring off into the distance. Let's see. Oh. The or data something was the origin of execu executive order numbers which used congressionally granted emergency powers to mandate the evacuations of most counties in the region outside of Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. Displaced families and individuals would be moved to temporary camps before places could be found for them in habitable areas. To enforce the order, the government threatened to nullify existing water agreements between the Northwest and Southwest, essentially turning off the taps for the so-called tri-state hot zone. To its supporters, 73H was a humanitarian effort designed, this is an interesting, oh yeah, let's see, uh, designed to preserve resources and help climate-stricken southwestern families start new lives. To its opponents, the order was a clear bait-and-switch. The federal government had broken a deal with Medina and a greedy land grab that employed eminent domain to seize mining claims. At the same time, it placed southwestern refugees in fenced-in camps, which were quickly disparaged as 73 hell, a provision that incited immediate riots, guaranteed. Also, wow, she was on the other foot. You know, this is very similar to how Native Americans were treated well I guess very similar but um they were forced off into re like into reservations right or like generous air quotes contracts were made for them like you know hey you know this will be better for you if you go over here um and basically there was a lot of like real like basically like stealing Native American land through like contracts air quotes that were like done in English so it was very difficult for them to read and understand. And also, like, basically they had, like, an axe hanging over their heads. But then also there was this whole thing and we're like, it's in your best interest if we move you. So I could see how op opponents of this would see it like that, potentially. Where it's, like, trying to get you out of the land because, oftentimes, where the Native Americans were living, had a lot of resources, right? So obviously we can't have them there. We have to get them out so the uh, white people can have it, you know? And those, you know, the Native Americans will stop killing white people because how dare they defend themselves, you know? Um, and, but I could see how in, in a desperate situation, right? In this, right now, in, in this time period, right? Um, there is a huge water problem. Actually, currently, in the current United States, in the southwestern United States, western United States, basically, all of it, like, anywhere from, like, Utah south, um 
is having a major water issue right now. Like, right, we've had some rain recently in Utah and Colorado. Um, but California is just, Southern California is just a bone dry desert. There's a massive drought issue going on right now. Places like Las Vegas and Phoenix are actually ridiculous. I could go off on a huge tangent on that alone, but those cities should not exist. <laughs> they are not anywhere near a very good source of water. Um, and they all basically steal from like, the, not steal, but they all take from the Colorado and the Rio Grande and like eventually there's just not enough to go around for all of them through these massive cities that are in these very bone dry areas right um so i can imagine how in this in horizon forbidden west like future right climate change is a huge huge problem um uh at the like and then they start fixing it and then the world gets you know eaten um but so los angeles las vegas and phoenix are all cities that have major water problems even now so i could see how they would want to get people out of there when it's so dire. It's like, listen, for your own good, and sometimes you want to shake people, right? It's very similar to, like, pandemic stuff, right? Where it's like, listen, yes, maybe there's some orders coming down from the government, from the centralized government, that you don't like, but it's for everybody's best interest. Like, truly, the government isn't out <laughs> to, like, always, anyways, not out to, like, make your life a living hell. Like, it's their job to keep us safe. That's the, that's the whole point of living in a centralized government like system right we're like gradually throughout time you can see you know especially and i can only i can only really a a attest to like uh, like basic archaeological examples but it's like especially in like um oh shoot Mesota mesopotamia i kept saying me mediterranean earlier i'm so sorry i'll hopefully correct myself on that i was like mediterranean is not right that's greek what are we talking about i'm I was talking about the mediterranean um Mesopotamia, <laughs> see, now I can't, now I've ruined myself, uh, but Mesopotamia, so ancient Mesopotamia, right, um, freaking, it, it, this is just the example that is the most, like, at least in the West, like, you know, tossed out, but, like, uh, so you had, like, people, because, uh, what's there, oh, not Cahokia, um, Katahoyuk. Katahoyuk is one of the is one of the big examples of like uh, people coming together into, like, larger cities from, like, hunter-gatherer sort of nomadic groups, um, coming together in forming a large city, um, you know, even though the first iteration of Talhuyuk was just kind of like a big mess, honestly, it was just houses everywhere, not like a mess, it was just a bunch of houses everywhere, at least as far as I remember from what I've read, it's only in later iterations of, of Katahoyuk that things start to kind of like, sort of like, um, systematize themselves a little more, and that's because, at least according to what we have in the research, again, we're just going off of, like, archaeological, like, scarce, you know, data in the archaeological region, or archaeological record, um, things started to centralize more, like, people started to, um, promote charismatic individuals, potentially, um, and they, they start to kind of, you know, speak for the people, they are given more power by the people, and so more and more and more, these people, these individuals are given, like, more and more power in order to centralize things, so that, so that resources can be disseminated from a central source, you know, or that protection can be organized from a central source, because it is more efficient that way than having, you know, a bunch of people decide, I'm going to shore up over here, I'm going to shore up over here, and then, like, there's a massive gap in between them, you know, and, like, not saying, like, obviously, like, smaller communities and, like, more disparate communities can work together, and, like, you know, obviously, like, make something that you would maybe potentially think came from, like, a more centralized source. You don't always have to have, you know, a centralized government that controls things. Um, but one of the better, one of the big examples of a centralized government being able to do a heck of a lot of stuff is the Egyptian ancient society, right? Where, like, the pharaoh was a god-king and had absolute power and could do basically whatever they wanted until things got really bad, and then they'd be, you know, anyway, that's <laughs> something else. But, um... But for many, 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 like, 3,000 years? What was it? Two two or 3,000 years that Egypt Egypt is, like, the, like, longest-running ancient civilization ever? Um, anyway, so people gradually, at least many cultures, gradually started allowing a more centralized source of power because it also, uh, in the larger groups, it was easier to, like, um, to create, you know, it's like safety, um, a set of rules, up, upwards upwards to laws, you know, um, that were accepted by the group as a whole, you know, when one person or a group of people, a group of smaller people would 
you know, initiate them, um, and enforce them, you know, um, so anyway, this is just my really haphazard, there's way better, way better sources, I'm sure I'm missing on maybe some of the latest information in the field. Anyway, I think what I was trying to get at is that, um, I, it's their job, essentially, people give up some freedoms, like, you give up some of your nomadic freedoms, you give up some of your, like, personal freedoms in order to live in a more condensed society. Like, that is just how it works. You don't get to do whatever you want when you live in a society, <laughs> when you live in a very, like, condensed city sort of an, sort of a society, you know? Um... You can't just drive on the wrong side of the road, for example. You know what I mean? Like, you'll get in trouble for that. You can't just be like, it's my right as an American or whatever. It's like, no, it's not. You're hurting people. Like, you know, like you going against the grain like that makes it so that people will get hurt. And, like, you're upsetting the status quo. And to be fair, sometimes the status quo needs to be upset. But not in stupid ways like that. Like the whole wearing the mask thing. Anyway, that's a whole other thing again. I'm so sorry. I'm just going off um, on various things. But, so yes, the government's job is to basically, a centralized government's job is to keep you safe. And so requiring you to move to a different area where you won't die is, it could seem heavy handed, but if you're stupid or if you are just really insistent that, oh, things will be okay, but willful ignorance almost, you know, um, they, they're they going to be forced to use heavier measures. But again, even me, I'm just like, you know, like you don't, you really don't, maybe it's just the, the American in me or something, I don't know. But like, I'm sure it's not just that, but like, you know, America and all that, you're taught that from a young age. But like, um, it's it, a heavy-handed government and something I very much am like, Ugh, you know, I don't like that, you know. But like, f for the greater good, if, if, if the communities itself, if the various disparate communities won't do something that will benefit them as a whole, I think it is the government's job to say, hey, this is what we have to do now because you're not doing what needs to be done to keep all of you safe, you know? And it's like, it's our right and choice. Well, do your children get a right and choice on that? No, they're following you because they have to, you know what I mean? I don't know. Anyway, I should just stop. <laughs> This could be a whole discussion. It could be really fascinating, honestly. Um, but anyway, I can see how both supporters and opponents, it's like, you know, proponents and opponents, especially with the mining claim thing, like, I can, because that's happened in the past, right? It's specifically with Native American tribes, not the mining claims, but like resources, you know? But it also kind of reeks of a conspiracy theory, you know? Um, but also, if you don't have water, get out, go away. You know, go somewhere else. Water's important. <laughs> anyway. I'm sorry, that was cool though. To see to see the parallels, right? Of like modern day issues. And that's what I really love about video games in a lot of ways. Is that you can see the parallels and it doesn't take that much work to like to see those and like be able to like I don't my game is having trouble rendering today. I even checked my settings earlier to see like, if there was something wrong, is this... Oh, okay, you want me to go over here first? Okay. During their war, the Ten climbed sheer rock. Braving blinding snow and wind, they stopped at nothing to protect their own. Also, I don't know if they sound invincible. <laughs> they weren't, but the visions tell us of their courage and strength. I don't know how much Something I believe our this. Aspire to, especially partly. The Sky Clan admires this one above all the rest. Uh, they make their home uh, in the mountains uh, northwest of here. I don't know how much I trust a museum exhibit based on like the you know like being like oh the soldiers you know like like the military propaganda you know be but like remembrance and all that is super important you know like obviously like the soldier soldiers do like a heck of a lot <laughs> obviously but it's still like a part of me is like mm, military propaganda this exhibit shows holographic representation of all seven G-SYN battle drone models deployed during the conflict 
They rapidly made a mockery of global non-lethal approach and an engagement after engagement, whether it was a surprise artillery barrage from the frigid slopes of Gold Mountain north of Big Bear Lake, or a desert ambush near the solar plants in the Nevada desert, or a wingsuit jump into the jungles of Colombia to stop an attack on a rare Earth convoy, as well as soldiers repeatedly proved that state-of-the-art AI and newfangled weapons were no match for human cunning. Okay. But then we, I know in Horizon Zero Dawn, we talk about how, like, a lot of, um, oh, and this makes sense to have a, a memorial museum set up to the to living soldiers, or just to, to physical, fleshy soldiers. Um, because when Ted Farrell, by the time Ted Farrell's around, they basically phased out um, human soldiers. Um, and we actually hear some of that from some of the... Um, some of the, log, the logs in Horizon Zero Dawn were, like, the humans are, like, coming back from, like, basically being, like, forcibly retired, you know? And they get, like, you know, I don't know, like, blue-collar work or whatever. Like, they get jobs. But, like, there's, there's no human soldiers left. They're all machines. So this is probably a memorial to the last, maybe the last few, like, specialized human combat squads. Interesting. That makes more sense. Because I'm like, I mean, it makes sense to, like, have, like, a special squad be, like, immortalized. But having a whole museum dedicated to just, like, one squad or something seems a little odd. This makes, this makes a little more sense. The context. Okay, some of them claimed the desert. All right. Ah, it's that, it's that thing that we saw before by the tall knight. What's this one about? The ten waged war against their enemy in the desert heat. A land too harsh for any to survive. But against all odds, they prevail. Everybody seems to think living so the in the desert is impossible. You must have passed through their territory on the way here. I did. They're quite nice. Except for that one they guy. Did. They uh, seem a little... extreme. They take that as a compliment. Did I... Yeah, I got that one. Um... I don't know. I, don't, I was thinking of something and now I cannot. Oh, but everyone seems to think living in the desert is impossible. It's not. People have been doing it for a really freaking long time around the world. Like, cool your jets. Ha, I didn't mean to make that fun, but it, like the jets, like flying jets. Ah, uh, no. That looks like a throne room and I'm not going in there yet. Soldiers in a jungle. Those were the ten? Yes. They knew how to use the jungle's depths to distract the enemy hey, until the perfect moment to strike. Generations ago, my clan, the Lowland, looked to this one for inspiration as they claimed the jungle to the southwest. <gasps> Fashiv! Here's the guy that died. From Decca, the wise and patient, patient chaplain of the Lowland clan, I finally learned the answer to a question that I had long vexed me. Before my capture, the only Tanakh that I had ever had a competition with, if one could call it that, was a prisoner at the Sunstone Rock, who spoke of taking the blood of uh, the blood and children of her enemies as her own. Her rant seemed to confirm the lurid stories about the Tanakh that I had read in my youth, yet in all my time in the Forbidden West, I had never seen such, such barbaric practices. I wanted to know if there was truth to the prisoner's words. There was. Those were all the old ways, Decca clarified, dating from the constant warfare between clans of years past. Since the ascension of Chief Hekaro, such practices have been outlawed, though not completely abolished. A few stray recalcitrants in exile still cling to them. Intriguingly, the acts themselves were never as malicious as the Karja portrayed them to be. Tasting the blood of a fallen foe was meant to honor their martial deeds, and orphan children were taken from conquered settlements to be raised as equal members of their new clan, which was considered to be a merciful outcome. I cannot help but see myself in this context, an orphan of sorts taken in by a new tribe. It hasn't been easy, and there are still those in the clan 
lambs who would reject me. Still, the more I learn about my new people, the more I see nobility that the Karja have omitted from their records. Yeah, there's a... Um, the, like, eating the flesh or tasting the blood of one's enemy um, has um, been used in martial contexts before as, like, absorbing the strength of your enemy or something, you know, or honoring them in some way. Um, and, yeah, taking the kids of your, like, the people you've defeated may seem cruel, but it's also, like, or you lead them to die, you know, or you kill them. <laughs> so. What does this symbol mean? You have an old world recording? This box was speaking with voices of the old ones, but now there's noise over them. Let me take a look. Where did you find this? We took it from an Asaram Delver. She was trying to steal it and other artifacts from Tanakh territory. The others were going to bury it in the sand with her, but then I heard the voices. Well, the data here is badly corrupted, but... Delta Juliet 9, you are weapons free and clear to engage the swarm. Good hunting. Copy that. We'll buy Zero Dawn the time you need. Delta Juliet 9 out. The voices of warriors from the past. And that Osiram wanted to sell them for shards. The bravery of the Ten should be remembered. I'm not sure what you mean by the Ten. We just, we just went the through this. This came from the final battle of the Old Ones. Another battle? I could learn more about it if I could find the other boxes. That Delver did say there might be more recordings to be found in the wreckage of ancient flying oh, machines. Oh, I have too. She claimed she had a way to locate them. Yeah. The box with the voice data on it is emitting a locator signal. I could use it to find the others. If you do then, bring them back here. I will see to it that they're treated with proper respect. Whatever sacrifices were made by these ancient soldiers, we will honor them. She has a way to find them, and they murdered, uh, murdered, they killed her. <laughs> I've already found a recording. I'll take any you find. Uh, let me give you something for it. These voices will be kept here. They will be remembered. That makes sense in a museum. Uh. Oh, I can pick. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow. I mean, I might as well get the legendary ones, right? I only need one black box for it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Blah, 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 blah. We already did the voice line. Do you get many Osirim Delvers looters. in the territory? They're looters. Fewer every time we catch them, but those thieving rats would do anything for the shards. There'll always be some who will risk coming here. And what do you do with the ones you catch? Bury them. Delvers spend their lives in the dust, so we bury them in it, alive. Oh wow! Okay. That would, uh, I think, deter most. Why do you want these recordings? Every battle teaches its soldiers. We should learn those lessons and honor those who fell. That is our way. Okay, bye. If I find more of those recordings, I'll bring them back to you. I definitely cannot go in that floor room. I do not have time for that right now. Exhibit allows us to hear their final moments using an interface donated by Sterling Malky. Oh my gosh. That's sort of horrifying, honestly. We can listen to any flight recorder that employs the industry standard air, FR, encryption protocol. Simply place a black box in the interface to listen to its contents. Please maintain a respectful silence as you hear the voices of the fallen. I don't know if I, I want to have my final moments be listened to by people. Uh, it depends. Like, I don't know. I guess it's like you know what's going to happen. Focus can detect beacons from those recording devices. Should help me to find any others that are still out there. You could, uh, I don't know, you know, if you have the time and the wherewithal, you could, like, have, like, craft a final message, essentially, for, like, your loved ones or something. But... Still, I think, I don't know, it's a little... It's, like, a personal, very personal moment, and maybe even, like, maybe, like, leave it for their family members or, like, loved ones, but not necessarily strangers. 
Oh, shoot. So this episode might be a little bit short, but I think um, going into the throne room is going to be a bit much. Sorry, I did ramble a lot about topics that are very interesting to me, <laughs> um, but unfortunately I don't do them very much justice in these episodes, I know. My knowledge is somewhat sporadic and self-taught in many, many ways, um, at least on like a wider global perspective. Um, so even a lot of the Native American stuff, like I didn't learn a lot of that in school, I had to learn a lot of it um, on my own. So I could be miss, I am missing huge chunks in my knowledge, um, huge gaps, you know? So uh, if I get things wrong, forgive me and please feel free to let me know. I totally don't mind learning new things, <laughs> obviously. So um, thank you all again for watching. I really appreciate it. Really quick, I want to say thank you to my patrons, to all my patrons, but to especially Rescalito, my sapling chair patron. Thank you so much. And Christopher, my tree chair patron. You're the super bestest. I really appreciate all your support very, very much. So thank you all again for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.